Greetings! Hello everybody! Welcome to the Mad Ballad Mike Podcast. This is episode three, which I have called Eight Limbs. It's going to be two quick segments. Well, two segments. The first one is going to be Eight Limbs. We're going to go into that in a second. The second segment is just going to be a, a quick final thoughts. We're going to do Die Coat, which is new. El Toth, the, the life tip of the episode, and then Sloat, the song lyrics of the episode as well. Obviously, you can see I've done some tinkering a little bit. Uh, you see the MVM here, the Bad Valley Mike, just kind of trying to spice up the desk a little bit. This here is a special little token I found searching in a box the other day. This guy here was a gift at least 35 to 40 years ago to me. And this little figurine has always reminded me of my father's father, my grandpa on my father's side. He died years and years ago when I was really young. But for whatever reason, this guy reminds me of him. So whatever apartment I've been in, whatever house I've been in, I usually put him on a ledge that kind of overlooks my, my place of living. And he looks out for me. I feel like, and every now and then it's a little, little music box. We'll just start playing out of nowhere. So it's awesome. So he's going to be looking over us today, wishing us all well. Again, welcome in. A uh, couple girls said I look good in this, in this little Walmart stock capping that I cap that I wore in a couple of the Instagram videos I made. Done. Sure. I'll wear it for an episode. Sure. Anyway, let's get right into it, shall we? Eight limbs. I got, I've got a nice little board for you here, folks, to follow along until I figure out what I'm doing technically. Uh, producing a better broadcast. We're going to use things like this so you can follow along with me. Eight limbs. We are not talking about arms and legs. We are not talking about tentacles. Some of you might have thought it had something to do with an octopus. What was your thought? Did you have any idea of what eight limbs meant? I'll tell you right now. It's eight looks into Mike's brain cell shortage. Eight looks into Mike's brain cell shortage. So these stories will kind of give you an insight once again into just me and what is going on in the enigma mind I was born with. Let's go, story number one, the exercise bike. So this takes place way back in the day. I'm gonna say I was about nine or 10 years old and my parents had just gone to a church festival slash raffle event a couple blocks away. I believe I was being watched by my sister, but I don't, I don't recall. That night, I was terrified. Like, I've been a hypochondriac for most of my life. I'm always worried about my health. I think we all are. But that, that was one of those days where I was just, I was breathing heavy. I was worried about death. When are they coming home? Am I going to be safe until then? I was just restless. And I ended up talking to God a little bit that day. I've talked to him a lot in my life. Put that tab was talking to him. And I'm like, God, how about we how about we make a pact? How about if they come home with a big prize? They had been to this festival for years on end and never won anything. They come home with a big prize. Can you promise me I will be alive until the age of 60 years old? 60. And so I'm talking to God, and I convinced myself that yes, we made a pact that if they come home with anything that they won, I am going to be alive and well until at least the age of 60. Well, believe it or not, that actually calmed me down a little bit. I started breathing normal again, sat down to watch TV. I'm like, good. So until they get home, it doesn't matter. If they come home with something, I'm going to live for a while. If not, you can start worrying about it again. I might be dead tomorrow. Whatever. So... I'm watching TV, and then a little bit later on in the night, I hear some commotion, some noise out by the front, and I 
go flying out there. And my dad is walking in the garage with a huge exercise bike. <laughs> I can't believe it. We won. Can you believe it? Look at this thing. And he's just like struggling. We're going to put it in the basement. We're all going to get in great shape. And I was just like so shocked. God, you did it. So I'm going to be alive till 60. So that is number one, the exercise bike. I, I still think about it. Like whenever I have chest pains or I, anytime I get sick or have sore throat or I see something on TV that scares me, COVID-19 scared the, and it was real. Lots of people did not make it through, but it didn't help that the media was trying to scare the crap out of all of us. But in the back of my mind, I still have that. I don't know that I'm going to make it to 60. I'm going to be turning 49 here later this year. And like I said before, tomorrows are not promised to any of us. So, but I do go back to that when, when I, I'm kind of stressing out a little bit. And I don't stress as much as I used to back in the day, but anyway. All right, number two, the doves crying. This is a story, a quick one. Prince, who was a big time musical artist back in the 80s and 90s, I don't know when he passed, but the 80s and 90s, he was huge. And one of his songs, I think one of his biggest hits, When the Doves Cry, always confused me because, well, let me play it real quick. Oh, it sounds like when the doves cry. Great song, right? But I never understood it until maybe my 30s. And I'm not I'm not joking. So in the early 80s, when I first heard it, I was, I don't know, 10, 11, whatever. So that's what it sounds like when, that doesn't sound like doves crying. What is he talking about? That guitar solo. This is what it sounds like when the doves cry. Do, 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 do. I'm like that, ne never did that make... Never did that. And whenever I heard that song through the years, I'm like, that, that song just makes no sense. I, I don't. And then in my 30s, it finally hit me how not smart I am. And that the lyrics, this is what it sounds like when doves cry. Is He's talking about the fight he was having with his parents. It wasn't the actual sound of the electric guitar solo emulating birds that are doves when they're crying. No. <laughs> My brain. All right. Number three, the tragedy of Leia. So I bought this house uh, about almost a year ago now. And it's a very humble abode. I'm very proud of it, but it's just a humble abode kind of out in the country of Indiana. The house came with three chickens and two rabbits. And I came with me and my dog, Sadie. So there was seven of us, right? I, that was actually a selling point for me. I love animals. I've said it before. I'm like, oh, here's my chance to own chickens and rabbits. I never even thought about rabbits. I, I thought about goats and pot pigs and horses, but sure, let's give rabbits a try. Well, the rabbits did not last long. I found out real quick that rabbits are not a good pet. They are, now they were outside to begin with. I tried to bring one inside, but within two hours, the room that I, I put it in this room actually in in a, in a big dog crate and it water was everywhere food was everywhere it's pee and and droppings were everywhere nope so anyway i rehomed both of them one to a co-worker who seemed to really want a rabbit so that's awesome gave her a bunch of stuff to go with it and then i rehomed the other one to a humane society who had a lot of space for it and i was going to take, take care of it better so then i had three chickens and one dog i ended up getting a dog a few months after I moved in for Sadie, for a playmate, Hobbs. Border Collie, black Border Collie mix. I named Hobbs after Roy Hobbs from The Natural, the best there ever was. As a playmate for her, I love animals, so of course, why not have another animal? Why not have another dog? 
When I did not have Hobbs, Sadie and I would go out and feed the chickens and all that. Sadie would always charge the coop. The coop has got chicken wire all around. They have their little house, so they can't. But she would charge, and I would always teach her, no, 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 don't, no. Those are our friends. We're good. No. Eventually, she stopped charging. And then I wanted to let them free range in my backyard, so I would open the cage and let them just free range in the, the fence yard in the back. And Sadie would just walk with them. I actually made a couple of videos on Instagram showing her just walking around with them, just, you know, just a walk in the yard with Thelma, Louise, and Leia. And it was awesome. Then Hobbs came around and Hobbs would do the same thing. Hobbs would charge at the coop when they were in there. And I would train him. No, 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 no. At one point I thought he had stopped enough where I... I was gonna let them free range. We were all outside. I, I had them by the collar and they were walking around and he kind of lunged at one. And no, 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 no. And he stopped. And then he was just kind of staring. I'm like, I think it's safe. So I, I kind of let go and he just watched them. I was doing stuff in the yard and everything was fine. Dogs dogs go inside. I let them roam around for a little bit and I go back out and put them in the, in the coop. Well, a couple weeks later after that, we had a really, really cold spell in Indiana. We're talking minus five, minus 10 degrees. And these chickens were like, like when I would check on them, I was Googling, how do I keep these things alive in sub-zero degree temperatures? And I, I use pine shavings for their bedding, so like most people. Don't you don't use a heating lamp because that'll set the pine the the pine shavings and their bedding on fire and you don't want fried chickens at least not these chickens to be fried maybe somewhere else. But what I ended up doing is I ended up every couple hours that I was home and this was like for a week it was really cold. I would bring them really hot steaming water and just put it in their little house. I saw a couple of them lop up the water real quick. So I, I, I'm not a doctor, obviously, but it had, it could have hurt their body temperature, right? The steam coming off the water, it got cold. I'm, I'm assuming that the water did not stay hot long, but it, it probably warmed up that little space a little bit. I know I also later warmed up some sausage biscuits and I would throw them in. The, they love those things. They eat those things up in a hurry. So they made it after the week. And I, I felt pretty good about it. I I like those things. They're, they're entertaining. They do lay eggs from time to time. I haven't eaten any yet. But they're entertaining. And they were given to me, uh, put under my control. So I want to take care of them. So we get through that. And then a couple days later, it was like 65. So it went from like ne negative 5 to 65 degrees within a few days. Welcome to Indiana. And I let them free range. Get out there. They were having the time of their lives, squawking a little bit, flapping their wings, running around, chasing each other, pecking at everything. Um, it was awesome. I'm like, yeah, let's let the dogs out too. See what's coming. Let the dogs out too. Let's have everyone enjoy the 65 degree weather after a terrible winter cold streak. I open the door and Hobbs takes off on a beeline faster than I've ever seen him run in the short time I've had him. And the next thing I know, I hear this horrendous scream. So I, I come running out and he's got one of them, like the back end in his mouth. And the, the other two, uh, Thelma and Louise go flying off into their where their coop is and just kind of watch the rest. <laughs> and he kind of he's like shaking them. No, no, Hobbs, no. Shit. And he and he puts and then he lets go and he kind of backs up a little bit, but doesn't go after the other chickens. I'm like, no, stay over there. Stay, stay. And I'm looking at this chicken, and this chicken's kind of flapping a little bit. Kind of looks up at me. You idiot. <laughs> And then his, his eyes rolled back. It was heartbreak, absolutely heartbreaking. Thing died in front of me. I could see like, I don't wanna to get too graphic, but I could see intestines and a little bit of bone. It wasn't spewing blood, but I saw like red tissue. 
I don't know the anatomy of a chicken, but I'm assuming that Hobbes punctured one of its vital organs. So rest in peace, Leia. Uh, <laughs> wow, that was a crazy event. And I, I just went through the range of emotions right away. I was so mad at Hobbes. I was so mad at myself. I was, all right, should I give away the chicken? Should I give away the dog? Is it any of their fault? Is it my fault? And I'm, I'm thinking to myself, Mike, you, your favorite meal is a buffalo chicken wrap, which five nights a week you eat at work. You work at a place that on any given day has more than 2,000 dead chickens in the building. <laughs> so, so all these thoughts are going through my mind, and I, I later, I, when I'm feeding the dogs later, and I see on, on the dog food that there's chicken in the food. I'm like, it's not Hobbs' fault. Now, granted, he had, he had killed a mole earlier in the day, so I guess he had two kills on that day. But it wasn't his fault. It's instincts. It's you, Mad Val Mike. It was your fault. You didn't train him well enough. And that's why Leia's in, in uh, you know, Pet Cemetery or uh, the Golden Gates above. So, to end the story, the next day, the... The two remaining, Thelma and Louise, were very squawky. Very, very squawky. I will give you an example of exactly how squawky they were. They sounded like this. But louder. Yeah, like that. That sounded like Thelma. And so the dogs were inside. I'm like, okay, well, they're either going to peck me to death or... Maybe they want to pay their last respects and it's a wake of sort. It's the chicken wake. I don't know. So I let them out. They didn't go to the site of the, the scene of the crime and they didn't peck me to death, obviously, but they were very lively and running around again and, and flapping their wings. And maybe they didn't like Leia. I don't know. But Thelma and Lee's were happy, 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 happy. That's the end of... The tragedy of Leia. All right, the Rocky Drive. We'll go on to number four, the Rocky Drive. I, in 2009, like a lot of people out there, came into some money trouble when the economy hit, the real estate market just fell out of the water. I was working at a steakhouse for a long time and making 150 a night. I had a computer job, making 1,000 a month. I wasn't rich, but I was doing fine. And then all of a sudden, within like a month or two, after the economy hit, I was down to 30, 40 bucks a night. And then the side computer job was like a hundred bucks a month. So I, I was going to move in with my parents. Well, I was about a week away from that when I decided, okay, well, I'm going to call this steakhouse I'm working at now, which I know very well. I've been there for years. The busiest, what, what's the busiest one they have? That's where I'm going to try and get a job. And that's where I'll make more money until I figure out what I'm going to do with my life. So it's on the strip of Las Vegas. I, I make a call. There was a couple scary phone calls there, but ended up getting the job. And so I'm on my way to Vegas. I thought I had at least a month to get ready, tie up all my loose ends and, and start this adventure. But one of the phone calls was, I need you here within two weeks. If you're here within two weeks, I will keep the job for you. Okie dokie. I'll be there in two weeks. So I am nervous as hell, excited, nervous, scared, all that good stuff. The Rocky Drive. I had never driven very long distances. This was from Chicagoland to Las Vegas. I think it was 28 hours or so. Now, I was going to stop two nights. Um, I was very low on money. So I was praying to God that I did not have a wreck or a flat tire or any of that. Very lucky that did not happen. But um, best gift, one of the best gifts I ever got from my father. My mom, obviously, has given me a ton of gifts as well, but from my father, GPS. In 2009, a GPS was somewhat still new. And there might have been iPhones, but if there were, if there were smartphones at that point, there weren't GPS on them yet. GPS, I could not have been happier when he set it up in my car with my brother-in-law, they, they kind of went over it with me. It was amazing. I was, before they had given me that gift, I was, I'm gonna make a thousand wrong turns. I'm gonna end up in Mexico somehow or Canada, whatever. 
but the GPS was a godsend. First day was really long, but I was on my way. The GPS, I loved it. It was amazing. It was always within 100 yards or so of you're taking a right here. You're following this highway there. Amazing. Loved it. Second day was another long day, but I could feel the end was near. Third day is what number four is about, the Rockies. The third day, I drove about five hours through the Rockies. Oh, my goodness. I mean, we're talking about steep inclines, steep, steep declines, inclines, psychopaths, lunatics, flying up and down on motorcycles, 18-wheelers. I thought I was in like an episode of, here's my death wish. I want to go 150 miles an hour on a highway through the Rockies and see if I survive. It was nuts. And then you add in all the signs I kept seeing. Watch out falling rock. Slippery when wet. Steep incline. Steep decline. Wild antelopes. Wild deer. I'm just like, I was freaking out. I mean, just freaking out. Just it, yeah, people honking at me in the back. And then the worst part was this tunnel. This tunnel goes actually... There's a couple of them, but one in spe specifically was at least three or four miles long. And there were two lanes, two, no shoulders. I'm, go I'm going like 50, and I'm just scared to death. There are people flying by me on the other side. There's people honking for me behind. Oh, my goodness. I, I, I don't know if I'm going to make it. I, I think I was still smoking at that point, and I was just chain smoking and trying to distract myself with that. I make it through. I'm on the descent. I'm starting to come down, but I'm still crazy. I'm out of gas. I, I, I pull over. I get into the, I guess, I must have looked. <laughs> you guys, where are your bathrooms? Okay, thank you. I go to the bathroom. I <laughs> I come back to the front. One of the clerks was like, first time through the Rockies? <laughs> yeah. his, his buddy was laughing. The people behind me were laughing. Oh, it was it was absolutely insane. And right outside of Vegas, I call mom and dad to let them know that I, I'm just about here. I'm just about safe. I'm like, so did you guys purposely not tell me about day three of the drive? Yes, Mike. We knew that you would not have even gone. <laughs> so that was, that was the, the, the rocky drive. Five, the post office. The people I work with, some of you have already heard this story. Too bad, you're going to hear it again. You loved it. Well, maybe you didn't love it, but I'm going to tell it again. I'm going to make you love it. I was at the post office about a year ago. I think I was sending my mother and my sister Mother's Day cards. It was there on a Wednesday. It was really, really busy. And like my father did when I was young, I was just engaging people around me, just having chit-chat, beautiful weather, somebody's wearing a... Green Bay Packers hat, Packers suck, old bears, whatever. Uh, and so I'm waiting there. And then finally I get to second in line. The guy in front of me is there to pick up a, a delivery. And, he, and they bring out a box and it says live animals on it. And you can't really see inside. There's there's holes in the top. And, and, and I could hear like birds in there. He takes the box, pays for it, and he's leaving. I'm like, so, hey, sir, out of curiosity, what's, what's in the box? And he says, pigeons. Like, oh, pigeons. So then me, Mad Ballad Mike, I stroll up to the front of the counter and proudly proclaim, couldn't they have just delivered themselves? Hold on, just hold on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Crickets, yeah, yeah. There were three people behind the counter. One of them smirked. The other two did nothing. I loudly proclaimed, couldn't they have just delivered themselves? I mean, pigeons. Like carrier pigeons? Like nothing. I looked behind me. There was like at least 10 or 11 people behind me. Nothing. I was like, I had a few jokes in that five seconds. I had a few jokes. That was easily my best. I thought it would kill. It did not. It did not. So whatever I mailed the letters, I'm, I'm walking out and I... And I I walk by and I see one of the ladies that I had befriended in line. I'm like, did you hear my joke? She's like, yeah. I'm like, nothing? She was like, eh, it was all right. 
<laughs> okay. All right. And I told that story about a lot of work and nobody laughed there. So maybe I should have told it here. All right. Moving on. Number six, the retainer, the retainer saga. Oh my goodness. I had a fear of my father. They, mom and dad never laid a hand on me. Um, but I, I was still very scared of them whenever I did something wrong. Didn't want to hear the yelling or the scolding or how dumb I was or you'll never do that again or else type thing. Like everybody out there, I had braces. I had retainer. I, I lost a retainer three times. Those are not cheap, which I was told a few times by Papa Bear. These are not cheap. And after losing the second one, I had gotten sat down by my father. You are not ever going to lose another one. You know why? Because if you do, you're paying for it. And you will work every single day until you pay for it. You know how, these, how much these are? You're going to be working for like a month straight. I don't like working now. Think about back then. I Absolutely not. So, all right, I'm not losing another retainer. So, lo and behold, I'm at... Middle school one day, eating lunch, shooting the shit with friends, whatever. And I put my retainer in a napkin and I finish lunch. I, I get all the garbage, put it in the bag, throw it out. And I go about my business. I'm in, I'm in class. A few minutes later, I'm like, oh, no. Oh, no. Fear came over me like a tidal wave. I didn't know what to do. The next three hours of school, I was I was just trying to figure out what to do. I, I In between classes, I had gone back to the lunchroom. I'm like, what? it's not gonna be laying on the table. You threw it out. It's not gonna be there. Get on the bus. I'm dreading the bus the entire way home. Uh, I get to my stop. And at that point, I am so terrified of what my father and mother are going to say to me that I begin crying. I, and I'm actually thinking this, this might actually help me, but I was really scared. I go in, dad's not home from work yet, which was good. My mom's there. It was almost like a Chris, uh, scene from Christmas story. And I'm crying. My mom's like, Mike, we'll figure this out. Mistakes happen. But I could see <laughs> the concern in her face, possibly for my safety. <laughs> I think she even muttered, oh, Dad, is, Dad is not going to be happy. All right, just go to your room. We'll, we'll figure this out. Don't worry about it. Dad comes home, and I hear just, I hear a little conversation. I'm like, what? What? Again? Do you know how much those things cost? Mike, get down here now. And I just, he let me have it again. Where, what, where was it? I'm like, I, I, I think I threw it out at lunch. I, I, had, I put it in a napkin. Didn't I tell you not? Yeah, I, I know. I'm sorry. I put it in the bag with all the other trash, and I threw it out. That's it. We're going. Get in the car. We're going to that school. I'm like, what, what do you mean? What? We're, we are going to that school, and we are going to find that retainer. I am not paying for another one. We had the car, we went, I don't remember if my sister was with me. I think I was just in complete shock this entire time. But I know for a fact, me, my mom, and my dad went to that school. My dad probably made a phone call before we went. And to make sure that the dumpster hadn't been emptied after lunch, we went into the dumpster. We went dumpster diving for my retainer. A huge dumpster with trash of all kinds from middle school. Food, papers, chemicals, whatever. We found my lunch bag in that dumpster. It had my name written on it in my mom's um, handwriting. I can't remember if it said just Mike or Mike Cute, but my name was on that. We found the bag. A funny thing about that is I was hoping we wouldn't find the bag because I had not eaten the banana that my mother had put in the bag that day for my lunch. And she I was scared of her yelling at me for that. 
<laughs> so we, we found the bag. There was nothing in the bag. There was no banana. There was no retainer. We did not find the retainer, nor the banana. Um, crazy, crazy story. We did go dumpster diving. I, he didn't kill me. We got another retainer. I never lost another one. He still talks to me. He's still my father. He hasn't disowned me. This is all good stuff. All right, moving ahead. We are at the real world. The real world is just my rude awakening of getting into work after college. My first job after college was a sports hospitality job where we would, I was in sales. I would call VPs and presidents of major companies and try and get them to buy packages to entertain their clients at major sporting events. So Super Bowl, Masters, golfing events, major league all-star game, whatever. And that company, oh, what a rude awakening to the real world it was because everything we were taught to tell the potential clients what we had, what we were doing, where they were, 95% of it was a lie. You were right off the 18th green. Uh, no, it was a 30 minute shuttle bus. Nowhere near the 18th green or fairway. Uh, these are these are not tents. These are raised platforms with drywalls and, and complete with roof and glass door. No, they were tents. I mean, that's just a couple examples. It was just a rude awakening to, to the world and to, to life after college and the rat race, all that good stuff. And in addition to that, which will lead into number eight, the real world is also, at that time, I was a big fan of the real world on MTV. One of the first reality shows, I think, ever was the real world. Started in on MTV in New York, and they went to a bunch of different places. During that time, I actually applied to the real world in Hawaii. I had one of my coworkers from that job. I was working downtown. During a lunch break, he had a big camera walking around, and my, my whole gig was... I'm just going to ask random people if I would be a fit for the real world. That will be awesome. In, in a suit and I'm in Chicago, we'll, we'll, you know, you'll film the, the, the skyscrapers and all that stuff. So we did that. I sent it in. Of course, I didn't, I didn't get it. A couple of months later, I got a postcard from MTV. And it, on one side, it was like, sorry, you didn't make it. But, and then flip it over to the other side. Here's who did. I'm just like, that postcard kind of pisses me off. Like, you, you picked that guy? And that guy over me? I digress. So that real world was going to be in Hawaii. I would have loved to be on that, that episode. Um, but I was not. Moving on from that Hawaii to this one, the Hawaiian walk. All right, I'm going to end this episode with the Hawaiian walk. So this was back when I was probably 10 years old. Mom and dad, I was lucky enough to have a mom and dad that took me and my sister to Hawaii a couple times on vacation back in the grade school days. And this specific time, they let me bring a friend and they let my sister bring a friend. So there were four of us and two of them. So there were six people. My mom and dad, they had a condo timeshare on the eighth floor. And the, one of the cool things about that is on the third floor, we could see the pool. The, the pool was on the third floor. We could see the pool from our balcony on the eighth floor. Anyway, one of the rooms my mom and dad slept in, the other room I think the, the two older girls slept in, and then me and my buddy were out in the, the family room on cots or, or, or couches. Well, one night I go to sleep, and I come to just about ready to jump into the pool. I can only assume that I was sleepwalking. And I, I obviously I didn't remember waking up. I didn't remember leaving the condo, I don't remember getting in the elevator, going down, pressing number three, going down to the pool. All I remember is just about, I was just about to jump in. Oh my goodness. I was a little dazed, but I finally came to, I go back to the elevator, go back to the eighth floor and go back to the room. And the doors, like most places, they lock behind them. Hotels or condos or timeshares, whatever. So I couldn't open it. I'm, I'm slamming on the door right? Slamming on the door. Nothing. Nothing. I'm still, I'm alert, but I'm still kind of in a daze and just, all right, well, I don't want to wake up the whole hotel. So what? Oh, I know. Outside the front door of this condominium slash hotel, 
is a keypad where you can dial the number to the room and then it buzzes and, and you know they can either buzz you in or they're, they're, gonna, they're gonna pick up the phone and I can talk to them and tell them what happened. Awesome. So I go back in the elevator, go down to the thing, go out to the front door. And of course the keypad, the, the phone thing is just, just out of reach from the front door, which of course also locks behind it. I take, I have a t-shirt and shorts. I take off my t-shirt. I stuff it in the door to keep it open. I go out there, I dial the thing. It's ringing, it's ringing. I had used this before, so I used the right number. I had used it the day before. It's ringing, it's ringing, nothing. There's the, the five people up there, none of them got up from banging on the door. None of them got up from the phone call. I was like beside myself. I, I didn't know, I mean, so. I go get my shirt out of the door, put it back on, go go to the elevator, go back up to the floor. I, I try knocking again, nothing. At that point, I didn't know what to do. I fell asleep in the hallway outside the door. To which a couple hours later, I think my mom opened up the, Mike, what are you doing out here? <laughs> well, boy, do I have a story for you. So anyway, that was the Hawaiian walk. Um, so I'm gonna wrap up this episode. Um, those are, the eight limbs, eight looks into Mike's brain cell shortage. And um, just to close the episode up, I have a couple of quick announcements. All right, Dico, which is did you know of the episode? That's a new one. 7% of people, going back to number eight, sleepwalk at some point in their life, mostly in their childhood. Very few of us sleepwalk as adults, but those that do, it, it sometimes gets very dangerous. There was a forensic files. I distinctly remember that had a murder in it. So be careful. Um, okay, Elto, which is the life tip of the episode. Don't allow different species of animals to interact with each other if you don't know how they're going to interact with each other. If you are not Caesar Milan or Steve Irwin or Jennifer Love, Jennifer Love Hewitt was the horse horse. If, if you don't know a lot about animals, do not intermingle them if you don't know. It's probably not going to end well. <laughs> That's the, the life tip of the episode. I'm still tinkering with stuff. Please give me all your suggestions. A ton of you have said good things. A ton of you have said how bad it is. I'm taking all of that. I'm trying to make this as, as great as possible. I want to keep doing this. I, I hope you laughed a lot in this episode. And I hope I'm going to continue to make episodes that make you laugh and, and you tune in. So please keep the suggestions coming. Which of these stories was your favorite? How about that? Put that in the comments of either Instagram or Facebook or my YouTube channel. Which one of these was your favorite? That would be awesome if you if you uh, got involved that way. All right, and finally, Slow, the song lyrics of the episode. I'm not crazy, I'm just a little unwell. And that is by Matchbox 20. And we will go out to that. Okay, what do you think? What's the difference no, between or, or not, and or we won't. That's fine. We could always just end with Big Machine like we started with, with Kubo Doll. This is Mad Ballad Mike. Until next time, here's my teaser. A week from Wednesday, I will have Hoops Hysteria with John, the regular white guy, as my co-host. Going back to a co-host. Get him involved. We're going to break down the NCAA men's basketball tournament Go Gators! Be good, do good.